Yeah, that's great. That's great news, fans. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, I gotta go teach now. Thanks for calling. Talk to you later. Okay, I just got off the phone with Vance. He told me, this is great news. He told me he's on the case. Cure for the coronavirus, he says it's coming. He's working on it. He says he's got all the science laid out. He's run some computer models. I don't know what he's talking about. Who's Vance, you ask me? Who is this Vance guy? I've known Vance for a long time. He's a good friend of mine. I'll show you a picture of him. I got this picture of Vance I'll show you. This, this is Vance, okay? That's him with his Ghostbusters uh, proton pack. You say, is that Halloween? No. Is that Comic-Con? No. Vance was a Ghostbuster. How'd I meet this guy yet? We worked together in college, Vance and I. And um, I remember about two weeks after I met him, he disappeared. Didn't see him for a while. I thought, you know, this is one of those people who came into my life, fun guy to hang out with. Then he disappeared, and then thought I would never see him again. But then he came back to work again. And I said, Vance, where have you been? And here's what he told me. He said, well, recently my father passed away. I said, Vance, I'm very sorry to hear that. And he said, well, I inherited a lot of money. Turns out his dad was rolling in cash, lots of money. He, even Vance didn't realize how much money there was. And he inherited a lot of money. I said, Vance, that's great. Why, why, why are you working again? Why don't you just you know, get through college and pay off your student loans and everything's gonna be good. And Vance tells me what he did with the money. He said, you're not gonna believe this. He bought a boat, he, he chartered a, a crew on this boat. He bought sonar equipment, all kinds of fancy devices, technology, computers. He went to Scotland, to the Loch Ness, to see if he could find the Loch Ness Monster. He just wanted to know one thing. Does the Loch Ness Monster exist? And he spent a month over there in Scotland. He sailed every part of that big lake. He went down with all kinds of scuba diving equipment, all kinds of probes and sensors, and all kinds of other implements of discovery to see if the Loch Ness Monster existed. His conclusion? No, it didn't. So, I'm glad Vance is on the case working for a cure for the coronavirus. But I always think about him because I always think, what does it mean? This statement he was trying to figure out. I'm gonna put it on the board here. I'm gonna put it in quotes because I'm talking about a statement here. Lock Ness the the Lock Ness monster exists. You see, think about it this way. Talking today about Thomas Aquinas, by the way. I'm wearing my Aquinas shirt. That's how you know I'm confident to talk about Aquinas. Of all the stuff that Vance took with him to Scotland, all the computers and all the fancy technology, the sensors, the probes, the monitors, sonar equipment, one more thing Vance absolutely had to have. There's one more thing absolutely crucial for Vance to have had to find out if this statement is true. The Loch Ness Monster exists. What was the one more thing Vance needed? It was up here. It was called an idea. He needed an idea of what the Loch Ness Monster is. A description. A definition. Either will do. What is the Loch Ness Monster? I'll tell you. It's a large water creature previously unclassified by science, living in the Loch Ness in Scotland. Here's what Vance was trying to do. Vance was trying to figure out, when he asks this question, does the Loch Ness Monster exist? Vance was trying to find out, of all the things in the universe, the inventory of all the stuff, 
Does the inventory of all the stuff in the universe include this? A large beast living in the Loch Ness in Scotland, previously uncategorized by science. That's what he was trying to figure out. This statement, if true, means one of the things in the universe is a large beast, uncategorized by science, living in the Loch Ness in Scotland. What does it mean to say kitty cats exist? Go ahead, ask yourself. Pause the video if you have to. What does it mean to say kitty cats exist? It means that among the things in the universe, you will find something that is a cuddly, purring, ferocious, mean little furball with pointy ears, and it goes meow. That's what it means. So what am I saying here? I'm just talking about generally. Generally, because I'm going to draw your attention here in a moment to a big exception to the rule. Generally, when I say something exists, I'm saying that among the things in the universe, you'll find something that corresponds to the description of the thing. If I tell you that leprechauns exist, what am I saying? I'm saying something in the universe is, what is a leprechaun? How do you want to describe it? Help me out here. Uh, 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 Irishman who hoards gold at the end of the rainbow. I don't know. Leprechauns don't exist. What does that mean? It means when you count all the things in the universe, when you've examined all that there is, you're never ever going to find Irishmen hoarding gold who live at the other side of the rainbow. That's all I mean. The reading I've asked you to look at for today. Not a lot of philosophy professors assign this reading. And that's why every year thousands of people are graduating introduction to philosophy with a fundamental misunderstanding of Aquinas. You're not going to be like that. You're, by the end of this lecture, by the end of this reading, you're going to understand Aquinas better than a lot of philosophy professors understand Aquinas. Lucky you. This reading today is called Question 2, Article 2 from the Summa Theologiae. The title at the top is Whether It Can Be Proved, Whether It Can Be Demonstrated That God Exists. I want you to think of it as having a different title, though. Here's what I would have titled it. What does the statement, God exists, mean? Notice that that statement, God exists, it kind of looks like that statement, right? It kind of looks like it, but it's different. Oh, it's very different. We have to figure out what Aquinas even means when he talks about whether or not God exists. Here's one thing he can't mean. He can't mean that when you examine all the stuff in the universe, in addition to kitty cats and lakes and people and fish, you're also going to find one more thing called God. That's not what this statement means for Aquinas. And now I must draw your attention to a very technical distinction. A distinction first coined by our old friend Wittgenstein, a very important distinction between what's called surface grammar versus deep grammar. I'll put it on the board. Surface grammar versus deep grammar. What's that about? What's that technical distinction? Why am I giving you this hard stuff? Let me try to explain it by way of some examples. Suppose I told you that I had a bagel for breakfast. Hmm. I had a bagel for breakfast. What does that mean? That means that if you were to look at the 
cameras that the government has secretly installed in my dining room to spy on me from this morning, you would find me eating a bagel for breakfast. Now I'm going to give you a statement. Statement one. Statement one was I had a bagel for breakfast. I'm going to give you another statement that has the same surface grammar, but a different deep grammar. Here it comes. The average American had a bagel for breakfast. What does it mean? Does it mean that there's somebody called the average American and we just have to go look at the secret cameras in that person's kitchen from this morning? No, no. There is no such person. There is no such person called the average American. Look, in both of these statements, what I've got is I've got a subject. In statement one, the subject was I. In statement two, the subject is the average American. And then an identical predicate, right? Had a bagel for breakfast. Both of these statements can be true, by the way. Are they true? Who cares? They both can be true. But what they mean at the deep level, something very different. The second one is a, a statement about statistics. I had a bagel for breakfast. That's not a statement about statistics. That's a statement about this guy. The average American, what guy is that about? What gal is that about? Not one of them. It's a statement about statistics. You know how Wittgenstein, remember him, Wittgenstein? Here's how he explained the difference between surface grammar and deep grammar. He said, I have a key in my pocket. Mm. I have a key in my pocket. What does that mean? It means, look, if he empty out his pockets, they're going to find a key. They're going to say, hey, look, a key. Then he says, here's another statement with the same surface grammar. I have a pain in my back. What does that mean? I mean, if you look inside my back, you're going to find it. Hey, look, here's the pain. No, no. How about this one? You're being a pain in my ass. So, I mean, if you look inside, you're gonna find out. No, no, so you're, three statements, each with the same surface grammar. I have a blank in my blank. Very different deep grammar in all three statements. Well, I'm here to tell you today that for Aquinas, this guy, for Aquinas, this statement has the same surface grammar as this statement but you better not think they have the same deep grammar. Not for a minute. Not for a minute. Why not? Why not? Lots of, I know lots of people who think these two statements have the same deep grammar. They'll even claim Aquinas thinks they do. I wrote a doctoral dissertation, 300 pages, showing that Aquinas doesn't think that. He thinks they have a different deep grammar. Why think this? Here's a couple of reasons. One. Remember what Aquinas keeps saying? He says it over and over again. He started saying it when he was like 10 years old. He says, I don't know what God is. You don't know what God is. I know what the Loch Ness Monster is. That's why I can find out whether or not the Loch Ness Monster exists. I have an idea of what the Loch Ness Monster is. I have an idea of what leprechauns are. I have an idea of what a kitty cat is. But Aquinas says, I have no idea. What God is. So to even ask this question, if this question is even going to be intelligible, it cannot have the same deep grammar as this one. Does Quattlepuck exist? Hmm? Oh, send me an email. Tell me if Quattlepuck exists. You can't do it, can you? Why not? Because you don't know what Quattlepuck is. If the question is going to have the same deep grammar as does the Loch Ness Monster exists, we're just at a loss, right? The reading I had you read for today is about like eight pages into the Summa Theologiae. The Summa Theologiae is thousands of pages long, right? Aquinas could have just quit writing at this point because he doesn't know what God is. So therefore, he should have said, is the statement God exists demonstrable? He should have said no. In the same way, the statement, does Quattlepuck exists, can't be answered. Well, Aquinas still has thousands of pages to go, so how is that possible? It's possible because different deep grammars. And hey, how about this? Whatever God is, 
it shouldn't be one of the things in the universe, right? This statement, I'm saying when you count up all the things in the universe, you're going to find a beast living in the Loch Ness in Scotland. If God is a thing in the universe, boring, and warning, don't worship it. No, no. If you worship something in the universe, we've got a word for that. It's called idolatry. And like that's like commandment numero uno. Don't commit idolatry. You've heard that. Don't worship false gods. How would you do that? You know, the, the commandments, hopefully you've heard of the Ten Commandments, it includes things like don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. Think about this for a moment. And you're going to see what I mean when I say Aquinas thinks that this statement has got something weird going on. How could you be tempted to commit idolatry? How is that possible? All of the commandments... I can be tempted to do otherwise. I'm going through uh, the, the checkout line here at Ralph's the other day. I bought some of them habanero peppers. Oh, man. And uh, I think they were 25 cents each. I bought five of them. And I went through the self-checkout line. And, you know, for these things, you have to type into the screen what the produce is. I typed in habanero. It brought it up and said, how many? And I thought, hmm. Instead of paying $1.25 for five habaneros, I could pay just 25 cents. All I have to do is lie. And if I do that, I'll have successfully stolen. You see, the thought crossed my mind. It was tempting. I didn't do it. No, no, you don't call your philosophy professor a thief. I steal cars in Brooklyn. I don't steal habanero peppers. So there's temptations to lie, to steal, to cheat. There's temptations to kill. How can you be tempted to commit idolatry? Well, Aquinas is telling us the answer. All you have to do is think that God is one more thing in the universe. All you have to do is to fail to recognize that this statement has a different deep grammar than this statement. God can't just be another thing in the universe. That's not worth worshiping. So, Aquinas says in this reading, you know, one of, the obje one of the objections that he raises is that, well, maybe the existence of God is just a matter of faith. Oh, how sweet. You hear people say that all the time. Just have faith. Aquinas makes a big deal out of faith, but not here. Not here. What's he say? He says, this statement is a preamble to faith. What's that mean? That means, look, we're going to have faith in a lot of things. And it's going to involve God. But let's get ourselves some rules for thinking and talking about God when we get into the faith language game. So, he doesn't know what God is. He thinks that if he's going to worship something, it better not be a thing in the universe. If he's going to have faith in something, and these faith statements involve the word God, he needs some sense of what he's talking about, some way of talking about the existence of God in a meaningful way. And it's going to require a different, deep grammar from any other statement that involves the word exists. So, what is the deep grammar for the statement, God exists? I'm going to tell it to you. I'm going to put it up here on the board. It is so darn important for thinking about Aquinas on God. You have got to memorize this mantra. You have got to memorize it. Don't even go to the next lecture until you've written this down 20 times in your book and memorized it and internalized it. You don't dare go to the next lecture until after this lecture you Skype your best friend and you tell them this mantra and then you explain it to them. Here's the mantra. For Aquinas, the statement God exists means there are features of the universe that ought to be causally accounted for, but which cannot be causally accounted for by any other feature of the universe. I'll say it again. I'll put it on the board. <laughs> the statement, God exists, for Aquinas, means there are features of the universe.
And you say, this sounds so weird. You don't understand what I'm saying. Don't worry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it. Just stay with me. Stay with me. That ought to be causally accounted for. but which cannot be causally accounted for by any other feature of the universe. Do I leave myself enough room? Let's find out. And you say, that's too small, Kovach. I can't read that. Your handwriting's sloppy. Hey, look, I sent you an email. Check the handout in your email if you can't read that. Copy it for yourself. There are features of the universe that ought to be causally accounted for, but which cannot be causally accounted for by any other feature of the universe. What's it mean? Okay, I'm going to break it down part by part. Then I'm going to explain it using a metaphor or an analogy. But first, a quick Diet Pepsi break. This lecture is brought to you by Diet Pepsi. Okay, here it comes. What's a feature of the universe? Here's a feature of the universe. You're watching this lecture right now. That's a feature of the universe. The coronavirus is spreading. That's a feature of the universe. Let's stick with the first one. You're watching this lecture right now. Why? I mean, you could be sleeping. You could be eating a Taco Bell, you could be exercising, you could be watching reruns of Community. Of all the things you could be doing, you're watching this lecture right now. How come? Well, maybe you want a good grade. There, what have I done? I found a feature of the universe that should be causally accounted for, right? I mean, you could be doing any number of other things. Well, so I've causally accounted for it in terms of another feature of the universe. What's the other feature of the universe? You want a good grade, or maybe you want to learn Aquinas, or maybe you're just dazzled by my general philosophizing and it excites you. I don't know. All I know is that whatever accounts for you watching this video right now, I can account for it in terms of another feature of the universe. If you want to see if you understand this, come up with your own example. And you say, oh, how do I come up with my own? Okay, I'll give you another feature of the universe, and then you causally account for it. It's foggy outside. I'm looking outside. I'm looking at the window right now. It's kind of foggy. How do you causally account for it? Something to do with the weather, atmosphere, Barometric pressure. Hey, I'm not, a, I'm not a meteorologist. Don't ask me about that. Okay, but I know it can be causally accounted for in terms of some other feature of the universe. So, I've broken it down. I've told you what a feature of the universe is. It's anything you can describe in terms of a factual statement. Mr. Whiskers likes wet food. My kitty cat loves the wet food. Yes, she does. That's a feature of the universe. It ought to be causally accounted for. I've seen some cats that don't like wet food. I don't like wet food. How do I causally account for Mr. Whiskers liking wet food? Something about how kitty cat taste buds have evolved, that it texture stimulates certain nerve organs. Okay. A, causally, a feature of the universe ought to be causally accounted for. Why should it be called? If you can ask a how come question, if you can reasonably ask the how come question, and then another feature of the universe, another factual statement that explains the first one. But what if there's features of the universe that cannot be causally accounted for by other features of the universe? Aquinas thinks there are. Notice. For Aquinas, the statement God exists 
isn't a statement about God. It's a statement about the mysteriousness of the universe. He's saying there's mysteries, unanswerable mysteries. Yeah. Okay. You want a you wanna metaphor for thinking about this? You want an analogy? I'll give you an analogy. Suppose you were here with me, and at the end of my lecture, you stand up, go over to this door, and uh, it won't open. Imagine if that happened. Doors are supposed to open, aren't they? Aren't they? Well, it's not opening. Well, let's speculate. Why not? I don't know why. And let's make a true statement for the moment. A true statement of the form, something exists such that, how do we fill in the blank? Something exists such that, can you figure it out? Something exists such that it prevents the door from opening. And you say, is it God? No, it's not God. Don't be stupid. It could be glue. It could be a lock. It could be humidity. I've seen doors that won't open because the humidity gets in there and it makes the wood explode. I don't know how it works. It could be someone on the other side. But we all agree something exists such that it prevents the door from opening. Well, so we're in here for years and years stuck in the philosophy conference seminar room, unable to open the door, talking about something existing such that it prevents the door from opening. That's a mouthful. Too many words, man. Something exists such that it prevents. Let's just name it. Let's call it Biggles. We all agree Biggles exists. None of us knows what Biggles is. Hmm. See where this is going? None of us knows what Biggles is. There's some things we can rule out. Biggles is not a cooking technique. Biggles is not a uh, small mouse on a string. Biggles is not a Beethoven symphony. Hmm? Okay, that's the metaphor. Aquinas thinks something similar is going on when we talk about the existence of God. Something exists such that it accounts for features of the universe that cannot be causally accounted for by any other feature of the universe. What are these features? I'll name a couple of them for you. We're going to get into more of this in the next one. Change. Why is the universe changing? Grandma died last week and now she's buried in the rocks. The milk has gone bad. Classes have been canceled. Every cell in my body undergoing constant change. How come? That's a reasonable question. Well, we'll talk about that more next time. And then finally, the biggest question of them all. Why anything at all instead of nothing whatsoever? Why Mr. Biggles? Why, why Mr. Whiskers, my kitty cat? That's a reasonable question. Why kitty cats? Why animals? How come there's organisms? How come there's life? Well, next time I'm going to show you. We're going to reach the limits of our mental capacity by asking the question, why anything at all instead of nothing whatsoever? Now, let me draw your attention to some important facts. For Aquinas, belief in God is simply a matter of recognizing the legitimacy of questions and simply a matter of acknowledging mystery. This is why God exists. That statement has a different deep grammar. He does not think that you're committing yourself to believing in some top cosmic architect or something like that. No, no. Belief in God for Aquinas is not a matter of saying, oh, by the way, atheist, there's one more thing in the universe that you forgot about. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The difference between theists and atheists on Aquinas' way of thinking 
is not a matter of the theist simply thinking there's one more thing out there. No, no. You really got to keep this in the forefront of your mind when you're thinking about Aquinas on God. Aquinas thinks that uh, God is not a person, not an object, in the ordinary sense of object at all. And you say, how do I even think about this? Aquinas' answer is, well, you kind of don't. Right? You can't. We're going to talk about something here in a few lectures from now called divine simplicity. It ain't simple, I'll tell you that. And it's going to show that when you're talking about God, you literally do not know what you are talking about. You have no idea of God, and you never will. Not in this life, anyway. No, no, not coming. Don't get your hopes up that maybe next year you'll finally figure out what God is. For Aquinas, the statement, God exists, I hope you've written this down by now. I hope you, the, sta uh, the statement, God exists, just means mystery. It just means there's features of the universe that ought to be causally accounted for, but which cannot be causally accounted for by any other feature of the universe. This is really important. This is why Vance could go looking for the Loch Ness Monster, but cannot go looking for God. He cannot say, oh, once I exhaust the objects in the Loch Ness, or the planet, or the solar system, or the galaxy, or the universe, I'm just going to see if one of them is divinity itself. No. The deep grammar is just too different. The, state, the statement the Loch Ness Monster exists is, at least in some sense, about the Loch Ness Monster, right? It's saying that idea, that concept, a large beast, living in the Loch Ness in Scotland, is instanced, it's instantiated somewhere in the universe. There's an instance of that idea in concrete reality. The statement God exists is not about God in that sense. It's about the universe and about the universe's mystery. The, uh, certain things about the universe that we cannot answer by saying something else about the universe. I'll unpack that more next time. For now, this is, this is, this is one of the most important lectures I give in any semester. When you understand what I'm saying to you today, you are going to understand more about philosophy than 99% of people in this country. When you understand what I'm saying to you today, you're going to understand more about philosophy than most people who graduate with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. If you really, if you really let it sink in, if you really get it at a fundamental level, you might want to watch this one again. You might want to call your friends, tell them what you've learned. Because this, this, this one, this one is the key to everything in Aquinas. So sit with it, copy this out 10 more times. It won't hurt. It won't hurt. I'll have office hours Thursday, Friday. Zoom me. Check me out. I've sent you the link. I've sent you the uh, address. Come talk to me. Come talk to me about Aquinas. Come ask me questions about what it means when Aquinas says God exists. Come ask me to help you better understand surface grammar versus deep grammar. Come ask me what's going on when Aquinas says that there are features of the universe that cannot be causally accounted for by other features of the universe. We've got to get this. We've got to get this. That pop quiz that I'm going to give in April, you've got to get this. Your philosophy of religion paper that I'll tell you more about in the future, you've got to get this. Okay, bye-bye.